Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm your host, Tom Powers. On this episode, I bring you a conversation from the Toronto International Film Festival, recorded on September 13th. I talked with Nanette Burstein about her new film, Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee, that airs on Showtime on September 24th. The film investigates the dark history of the American entrepreneur. He made millions with the McAfee antivirus software, then relocated to Belize, where he created a compound in the jungle, like Kurtz in the Heart of Darkness. He assembled his own security force and kept a harem of young women. You know, going down to Belize and meeting the people and, and you know, seeing that level of poverty and, and how much people had been exploited by him um, very much kept my spirit going and, and my determination going. In November 2012, McAfee had an argument with his neighbor Greg Fall, another American expat, who was later found murdered. When Belize police sought to question McAfee, he fled the country and eventually returned to the United States. The murder remains unsolved. This year, McAfee sought the nomination to be president of the United States through the Libertarian Party, but lost out to Gary Johnson. In the film Gringo, Nanette Burstein draws upon the work of other journalists, including Jeff Wise, the film's executive producer. She conducts several new interviews with stunning allegations of a rape, another murder, and fresh testimony about the death of Greg Fall. Here's a clip from Nanette's narration setting up the film. The last 15 years, I've been making documentaries on complex and controversial celebrities. I've been fascinated with how being famous can put you under a cruel spotlight, but it can also allow for extraordinary privileges, like the ability to get away with things. Was this the case with John McAfee? Burstein has been making films since the 1990s. Her collaboration with Brett Morgan on the ropes about young boxers in Brooklyn was nominated for an Academy Award. They went on to make The Kid Stays in the Picture, about Hollywood legend Robert Evans. On her own, she directed American Teen, set in a high school, and the ESPN 30 for 30, about ice skater Tanya Harding, called The Price of Gold. None of those films faced the same intensity or intimidation as Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee. In the lead-up to the film's world premiere in Toronto, Nanette received a series of threatening emails. The first screening had a heightened level of security. We recorded this conversation two days later at TIFF Doc Conference before a live audience. As I was editing this conversation, I noticed two things, my inconsistent pronunciation of McAfee and a lot of laughter over such a dark subject. I think Nanette and I both had a sense of relief after weeks of tense anticipation for the world premiere. I started the conversation by asking Nanette if she was conscious that this film would be different from her past work. I mean, I was somewhat conscious, I, I, but I didn't know exactly what I was going to find. That I, I mean, I knew um, there was another murder that it, uh, he was perhaps implicated in that hadn't been reported. But beyond is, is that, that, is that something that you had kind of gotten through your colleagues who, uh, who yes, were working on this? Yeah, yeah um, Jeff Wise, who's a journalist who'd been following John in the press for a long time. Um, had uh, uncovered that and a couple of people that were actually involved in it and, uh, or one person. Um, and then we uncovered a second person. So already I knew that, but as far as whether it was, whether John had been involved in this other murder that had been very public, which he was a person of interest in, and this rape that I uncovered and you know, his, some of his other crazy behavior, I was not really aware of until I was already in the mix. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> so can you describe some of the intimidation that you felt in the making of, the, of this film? Well, a lot of the intimidation was from John himself. Um, who uh, initially was hesitant to be interviewed, and I thought maybe he would come around, and he, at a certain point I realized he wasn't, but he would email me constantly. Some of the emails were nice, 
and some of them were even like weirdly flirty, and then other ones were very, very hostile and threatening, and especially as the year went on. Um, and there was a moment, I think, that was really the only moment that I was afraid, really, truly afraid. And he had, I had ambushed him in one of his debates. Finally, I'm like, okay, he's not gonna sit down with me for an interview. We've had this cyber relationship. We've talked on the phone, but I wanna meet him in person. Maybe he'll let me ask him a few questions. So I, I came to one of his events in New York City and, and surprised him there. And uh, I thought he would recognize me. He actually didn't seem to recognize me. I thought, well, it, you've been emailing this person for 10 months, like, haven't you Googled me? But I don't know, he was like, really, you're Nanette, huh? Um, and, then he start, and then he walked away. A half hour later, he started writing me very hostile emails for the next 24 hours, even in the middle of the night. And the last email was, which I include in the film, is you are the Satan. And like every, it was like a bad police song. Every breath you take, every move you make. <laughs> it wasn't I'll just be watching you either. It was I will make it my life's mission to take you down. You are my, you know, final mission in life. And, uh, and then he describes he, you as his magnum opus. Well, in a different email, yeah. yes, yes. Everything is very larger than life with John. And, uh, the, but the, the thing that freaked me out was that was a very hostile email. But then he sent me a text message five minutes later. And I was alone. And uh, it said, I have very, something very precious to send you. Can you tell me your address? And all I knew is he could still be in New York. And he's got a license to carry bodyguard. And I'm like, move away from the windows, you know? And I was freaked out. And then I, I call my husband, who's a war reporter. And he's like, Pfft. he totally laughs at me. <laughs> Thinks it's ridiculous. So I'm like, oh, OK. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. Um, but there was definitely moments in Belize. I mean, there were a lot of people that were in John's world that came from you know, the, the toughest gang in, in Belize City. Um, and while they were seemingly nice to us, they, you just didn't know. And the more trips you make to a place like this, and the more people are familiar with their presence, we started to get nervous. There had been a couple of murders of Americans in Belize, so we started to, to have security with us. Um, how much does that get in your head, and, and how do you handle uh, having that in your head? Well, and I live in denial in life, so I'm totally <laughs> fine with it. <laughs> no, I was, I mean, I, I just put it out of my mind. I, I maybe perhaps foolishly, but um, I mean, you do look around and you make sure, you know, you're safe and, and try to be smart and calculating and not be foolish. But if you, if you get afraid, you're not going to be able to do your job. So in this reporting, you do a lot of interviews with people in Belize who knew John McAfee there. There's a lot of rumors that swirl around the murder of Greg Fall, mm -hmm. uh, his, his neighbor. What was your process in sorting out rumor from truth? It was, I mean, there were a lot of rumors. There were a lot of tall tales. Um, it was really finding the people that had been directly involved with him and making sure that there was always more than one source on something that could, where the stories lined up exactly. The people that didn't, you know, that couldn't have corroborated in lining up their stories. And if there was more than two or three or four and, and whatever was on record, that it all matched up. I mean, I heard all kinds of stories, like, like that John had people enslaved in mines. I heard, you know, he was a major drug dealer. I mean, I heard all kinds of things, uh, that there were two other murders, Perhaps some of it was true, but I couldn't substantiate any of it. None of what you just said is in the film. No, yeah. not in the film. No, not at all. No, I mean, that's the point is like, you really have to be careful that you don't just believe the rumor mill and, and that there is, you know, a lot of evidence or as much as possible that you can find that otherwise it's, it's really dangerous to put that in a story if you don't think it's true and there's a lot of evidence behind it. Something that's so striking about the story of John McAfee is that a lot of journalists have come in and out of this uh, story before. So there was a famous case of uh, a vice crew who was following John McAfee after he was fleeing Belize, having been a person of interest in a murder, and vice 
accidentally posted a photograph of him that gave away his geolocation. They didn't accidentally post it. Hmm. They were like, we are with McAfee suckers. And then that was literally the headline of the post. But what they accidentally did was left it, be, it, left it GPS encoded so they hmm. could find his location and realize he went into Guatemala illegally and they arrested him. So like, if you're on you're the, the lam, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> don't take reporters who are going to make those kinds of mistakes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's but one example of reporters who have come in and out of this story. And to my knowledge, no one has put together as many pieces as you and your team have. And I wonder, as as you have studied the the, the course of reporting on this, you know, what does it tell you about the state of reporting? Well, I, I mean, I think it's really unfortunate, you know, especially being married to someone who's a journalist, you know, all these bureaus have been cut out of the budget, the, you know, it's all about the 24-hour news cycle. So for a moment, when John was on the run and there were these crews following him, and then two weeks later, everybody forgets and they, there's no interest in reopening it. Um, so as a result of that, a lot of documentary filmmakers have kind of taken that place in our world of you know, really spending a long time investigating things that, that the media outlets don't normally do and the news doesn't normally do. Because one of the things that's fascinating is that when reporters would, you know, parachute into Belize to, to cover John McAfee or wherever he was, <clears throat> it would be that John McAfee was the story. Um, right. And what you were able to do is tell the stories of everyone who was around him and affected by him. Yeah, I mean, he, he did, you know, enormously affect people on, in his world in Belize. I mean, he created a little kingdom that he lorded over, a very strange kingdom. And, um, and you know, yeah, so you have this point of view of all the people that were affected by him while also trying to give a character portrait of who he was. In today's world of uh, independent documentary filmmaking, in contrast to the days when, say, networks were stronger, and, and as a reporter, if you went in somewhere, you had the backing of an organization, of their resources, of their legal team, of you know, other kinds of expertise that, uh, that you might call on. And working as an independent filmmaker, you're, you work with a much more uh, shrunken set of uh, of resources. Um, what are you talking? Our budgets are huge. <laughs> no, it's true. Yes. Uh, I mean, in your case, who were the, the the people that you could call upon for you know support and even uh, not even just financial support, but just you know what should I do if I need a bodyguard in Belize support? Well, I, I had an amazing team. Um, you know, Chiang, uh, my producer, Michael Hirshhorn, my executive producer, were incredible in supporting me. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, I think it's getting a little sketchy. I think we should have bodyguards. And we would find someone locally that seemed, you know, um, legitimate and, and safe. And we would do that. And as far as there were an enormous amount of legal issues on this film that I had never um, had to encounter before just because of the kind of accusations that we were making and bringing up. When you watch the film, you'll get what we're talking about. I mean, there there is, you know, two murders, one which had never been reported before that he is implicated in, um, a rape case. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff. And, and uh, you know, so so we, we had our own lawyer, and then Showtime actually hired outside counsel as well that specialized in this. Um, and that, that became hugely important in the editing process. And, and, and even, even, actually, I would just call up and say, like, well, what about, we, we got a whole, um, we had a very long meeting with the, our attorney beforehand about, you know, what you can do and what you can't do and how many sources you need and other evidence and what you need to save and collect and um, you do your due diligence on. Um, and if something would come up, I, for one of the first calls I would make is to the attorney, uh, just to make sure this is all above board and good. Um, and, and then, of course, it came up more in, in, the, in the editing process as well. So what were the things that kind of kept you going in this project? Uh, you, you described earlier like there was a point where, you, where it was too late to turn back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of people who are in the film who have had their lives affected in, in, in serious ways. 
And was that something that was weighing on your mind? It was. It was hugely weighing my mind. You know, going down to Belize and meeting the people and, and you know, seeing that level of poverty and, and how much people had been exploited by him um, very much kept my spirit going and, and my determination going. And, you know, I mean, I was also just sort of amazed when I discovered that his story literally was heart of darkness, that he lived in, he decided to move to the jungle on a river and things just got darker and darker, that he had 15 armed security guards, that he imposed a curfew on the local town with his armed guards, that he had a harem of girls, which he, you know, who were really young, you know, 15 to 18, who, you know, uh, he exploited completely as a sugar daddy. I mean, it just, it, it really surprised me how much it felt like this, this, this iconic story that we've all heard of. And it's this idea of the ugly American who suddenly realizes, like, I can do anything. Like, this is the kind of society that's not really prepared to properly investigate things. They've got a whole bunch of other issues, drug deals, murders that they're dealing with. And they kind of stay away from the rich white man. Um, and he just... As he got away with things, he just pushed the envelope further and further and further and further until, you know, eventually he pushed it too far and he, had, he realized, like, I got to go. I mean, all they wanted to do was bring him in for questioning and he went on the run. Like, he knew. He had so many skeletons in his closet, this is my theory, that he just took off um, because, you know, he knew, he knew the, the, the breadcrumb trail he had left. And he was hoping no one would go back. And then we did. So since the film played two days ago, has, have you heard any reactions from anyone associated with the film? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, the, the press has been very kind and given the film great reviews. Um, you know, people have seen it, my friends. Um, from his crew, he has, he's sort of developed a, a similar type of entourage in the States you know, instead of paying people, he, what happened was when he was on the run in, from Belize, he developed a blog, and he seemed almost like this action character, and he pretended that he was a victim of corruption in Belize, and they were out to assassinate him and frame him for a murder. And people got really involved in his blog, and he started befriending them, and they, most of them don't live in the same city, um, so he has these relationships with people. Um, so, you know, some of those people have posted things, um, just hearing about what was in the film, and I got a very strange series of emails from Anais Nin, was the name of the email address. <laughs> um, it seemed like it was him, you know, telling me that he'll be watching me. Uh, it was particularly in response to what my sexual activities might be in the future or now that he needs to uh, make sure that, you know, if, if I didn't do anything kinky, then he would uh, make it up and put it out there for public consumption. That was interesting. Um, uh, I was like, if you're going to do that, why write it to me for <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> in Gringo, Nanette conducts a revealing interview with Alison Adonisio a microbiologist who went into business with John McAfee in Belize. John got weirder and weirder. He would go on these rants. He talked about taking over the Belizean government. He talked about his hitmen, and at this point, I was starting to believe it. You said hitmen. Did you mean to say hitmen, not security guards? Yes, he would absolutely call them hitmen. He would talk about his hitmen. He would talk about how he could have people hurt or killed. And, um, you know, honestly, I was, I was scared. In the interview, Allison accuses McAfee of drugging and raping her. I asked Annette what it took for Allison to go on the record. I had started speaking to Allison on the subject, um, and I wasn't... I didn't know at the time that that had happened. I knew that she had a company with him in Belize, uh, this natural antibiotics company. She was a uh, postdoc, worked at Harvard, very smart, educated, and he had funded her research in Belize, and it was her dream job. And, and then she suddenly left a couple of years in, and I wasn't really sure what the story was there. So I called her. At first, she was very hesitant to talk to me. 
uh, it took a it took a bunch of phone calls and and really wanting to know you know well, what what was my take on him and finally we ended up having this six hour phone conversation where we really uh, bonded and she ended up telling me the a whole six hour phone a six hour phone conversation yes. I was on vacation in Hawaii, like taking a break from Belize for a couple of weeks. And my husband comes back and he's like, did you go to the beach? I'm like, no, I've been on the phone for six hours <laughs> in the condo. I haven't left yet. Um, and, but she told me the whole story. And, um, you know, we talked and I was very surprised. I didn't realize that had happened. And we talked a lot about it. And then I really, I didn't want to push her though to, that's such a, a courageous thing to do and, and something that someone has to decide on their own. But she said, listen, I'm telling you because I really do want to come out with this story because, you know, when something like this happens, you know, where someone has been drugged and raped and, you know, someone, if they haven't dealt with it, they just try to move on in life. But she couldn't with him because he was constantly in the news and she was constantly associated with him from her past with him. So when he was on the run, all the reporters from Guatemala, uh, from uh, America called her and found her on her LinkedIn page or called her at work or, you know, now he's running for president in the United States and she can't hide from this guy. She knows she has to not only deal with it emotionally, but also she felt like, okay, now he's running for president and he's the CEO of a major cybersecurity company and she's seeing this stuff online and there's all these young people like her who are believing in the dream, like I'm gonna do this for you or that for you, and she was worried that he was gonna do the same thing again to somebody else, and she felt like, okay, if I can just save one person and help them, then I'm willing to come out with my story. She, by the way, had gone to the FBI immediately when she got back, um, but because it had happened in Belize and it wasn't a homicide case, they had no jurisdiction to do anything. They were keeping watch on her and you know, told her that she was safe. Um, and she did actually have some evidence, which I did my due diligence on, but I, 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 I told her I wouldn't talk about it. Um, but anyway, uh, unless it had to come up. But, uh, you know, it was so, anyway, I started talking in October. It wasn't until this July that she decided to sit down with me on camera. Um, and I never knew until the last second if she really would. I mean, like, even up until the last second, you know, she was still talking to me about, I don't know, I'm scared. I'm like, it's really up to you. You know, I don't want to push you, but if we're going to do it, we have to do it now. <laughs> um, or we just can't, I won't have time anymore. Um, so she didn't, she, she had spent some months sort of getting her life in order for this. Of she, she changed her job. She's sort of create, you know, she went to serious therapy. You know, she sort of got her house in order in order to do this. It was a big deal for her. Let me talk to you about another interview situation. You interview someone in the film who uh, people have alleged might have committed one or, or maybe two of these murders. Um, how did you prepare yourself for that interview? You mean the second time I met with him, once I had found out that he might have been? Well, either, t uh, either time. Uh, Oh, well, the first time, you know, I knew he would just seem like one of these other guys that had, I mean, work with John, was a gangster of uh, somewhat notorious in Belize. Um, but he seemed so sort of mild-spoken on the phone. <laughs> and uh, he was, um, he was fairly open with me. I don't know. He seemed to be. Um, and... Uh, but the second time I met with him was once I had already had some information that he might have actually done this hit for John, um, um, for this, um, the American guy who was killed and believes that, that John was uh, implicated in, um, that John had possibly hired this guy and there was evidence of it. And um, People brought that guy's name up. And, yeah, uh, and yeah. People brought his name up and, and said they had wired him money right beforehand and they had to pick him up, but, you know. So now you have to go back and interview him. Now I have to go back and interview him. But I didn't just interview him about that. I ended up re-interviewing about everything. And then at the very end got to that. And then, and then went they into always, something wait else. Till the, wait till the end for the tough question. Yes, uh, exactly. I didn't just launch into that. I was very nervous, too. I was really very nervous. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then... Do you think he was uh, expecting that? I mean, do no. You, no. I do not think he was expecting it, no. And he got nervous. 
he sort of he was laughing, giggling nervously, and wiping his brow a lot, mm -hmm. and and I had to be the tough. And this is not something I normally do. You know, I'm normally like the em empathic type of interviewer, mm. and I had to be the tough investigator, which you know. Um, but I, I did I did try to you know. Uh, be as tough as I could um, without having him suddenly attack me across the room or anything. Um, fortunately, I had a couple of men on my uh, crew. <laughs> Just in case. I don't know what they would have done. But. <laughs> uh, and he did come armed every time. He came armed. He was packing. Yeah. So that's of concern. Like we go to put the mic in him and it was like, oh, can you just move your handgun over? And there's like one in his sock too. You're like, okay. Did you have bodyguards with you? Not then, no. Uh -huh. That would have been a good time. But. <laughs> <laughs> From the audience, Nanette was asked why she chose John McAfee as a subject. Well, you know, I had done... Um, I, I have a fascination with people that uh, come from money and power and fame and how that affects their life differently. I did a, a film on this movie producer, Robert Evans, who I, he didn't do that. He, he did actually get implicated in a murder as well at one point. But, and then I'd done a film on Tanya Harding. And I, I, I do have a fascination with the privileged, you know, sometimes it's harder for them. They're under the spotlight, but also other times, you know, you can get away with things. And so he was someone I started, I also started following um, when he was uh, on the run and going to Guatemala. There was an amazing Wired article about him, and I started reading all the press about him. And um, so I had a long-term fascination with him. And then when Jeff Wise, the reporter, had unearthed some new contacts and interviews and brought it to me, I thought, well, this is worth looking into. Um, I think especially like, you know, with Donald Trump running for president and, uh, you know, there's just there's this era in America particularly, I think, um, where uh, it just doesn't, you know, and maybe seeing the jinx and these other subject matters where it, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem equitable that um, if you come from that kind of money, and power, um, and you are a master manipulator of the media, that you can just say like, oh, that's a hoax, or that was an assassination, or I'm the victim, and then everyone kind of just believes you without really looking any further. There's a real sense in this film of trying to hold someone accountable, someone yes. who's seen, who treats themselves as above accountability. Right, no, it's funny, I was telling someone at a kid's birthday party about the film, they're like, why are you doing this? What are you, like the morality police? And I was like, I guess so. <laughs> I've never thought of it. In the back of my head, they were thinking, why is my kid friends with your yeah, kid? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're going to leave the party now. <laughs> I want to thank Nanette Burstein for talking to me. Her film Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee, airs on Showtime on September 24th. I want to thank TIFF Documentary Program Associate Dorota Leck for helping to organize Doc Conference. In our next episode, we bring you a new conversation with Jonathan Demme, talking about his performance films with the talking heads Neil Young and Justin Timberlake. And that's another part of my bottom line formula is like, don't cut, try not to cut. Hmm. Um, uh, latch onto a shot that's working and, and don't get sucked into that artificial energy of trying to pump things up by cutting on the beat and stuff like that. We're going to release that episode tomorrow as a bonus to our usual Thursday schedule. Why the rush? Because next week in New York City, I begin hosting a retrospective of Demi's documentaries in my screening series, Stranger Than Fiction, at the IFC Center. Each Tuesday for six weeks, I'll present a different Demi film, followed by a live conversation with the director. It starts on September 27th with his breakthrough concert film, Stop Making Sense, capturing the talking heads on their last tour. If you're in New York, I hope you can join us. To get tickets and more information, go to purenonfiction.net. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. Thanks to our team, Series producer, Michael Scotty Jr. Sound mixer, Kyle Murphy. Web designer, Cross Strategy. Marketing coordinator, Sarah Modo. Social media handlers, Jordan Smith, Alana Schreiber. And executive producer, 
Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. If you like what you've heard, the best way to support us is to subscribe on iTunes and please spread the word to your friends. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.